Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Philips Securities Research Morning Call. For today, we have a stock counter update clip on the ground for Sheffield Green IPO, some technical analysis, as well as a couple of micro and sector outlook. It will be the US fourth quarter strategy and stock picks, uh, Singapore banking monthly, Singapore REITs monthly, as well as Singapore weekly. So without further ado, let me have over time to Jordan to get started on the US fourth quarter stock picks. Thank you. Thanks, Zane, and good morning, everyone. So, like Zane mentioned, I'll be just running through some of our stock picks that uh, over the fourth quarter strategy event that we had Thursday last week. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just, I guess, in a, as a quick summary, most of the stocks that we pick actually kind of kind of sit in the digital advertising, uh, AI, as well as EV space. Uh, so the first counter I'll be speaking about will be Alphabet Inc. Um, and we have a title here, you know, advertising on the up. Uh, so the main thing for for Alphabet is that we think that advertising looks to have kind of bottom, um, especially uh, digital advertising at least, especially after it's been kind of uh, coming off its highs uh, during COVID. You, know, you can see that in the chart on the left here, uh, significant declines in terms of uh, ad revenue growth. Um, although ad revenue has kind of been steadily improving over the last two quarters, so it was actually contracting in the fourth quarter of last year and then uh, in the first quarter of this year as well. But uh, in the second quarter, it actually improved uh, and it actually grew about 3% year-on-year, -year, which is not much, but at least uh, they are starting to, sign, uh, to show some signs of uh, green shoots coming through in the digital advertising space. Uh, the second point that we have is that we think that AI, uh, not, not really the thing, but we're seeing AI driving better products uh, with better performance. Uh, this is important for a digital advertising company like like uh, Alphabet because essentially if you're leveraging a technology that can help to deliver better performance on your advertising uh, metrics and your targeted advertising advertising uh, naturally you'll be able to, to, to charge a little bit higher uh, to charge advertisers a bit higher to advertise on your platform uh, and thereby just uh, increasing monetization for, for some of your products uh, so we think you know, AI is no stranger to, or rather, Alphabet is no stranger to AI. They've been leveraging it over the last 10 plus years. Uh, just that, you know, as AI technology has gotten better and, and with generative AI, uh, kind of a leap forward in terms of, you know, AI products in general, uh, uh, this should actually help to benefit Alphabet moving forward. Uh, predominantly because Alphabet is the, the main kind of player in the digital advertising space. So it's essentially them and Meta, uh, the top two biggest guys, but, but, but by far, Alphabet is the, the leader in this category. Um, the last point that we have is if we expect its leaner cost structure to bear fruit with increasing operating leverage. So if, if you all didn't know, Alphabet laid off about 8 to 10% of its workforce over the last uh, 9 to 12 months. So it's quite significant layoffs. Uh, at the same time, they're also consolidating a lot of their office facilities uh, that they expanded into over the last two or three years. Um, you know, especially as hybrid... Uh, you know, work kind of continues for most of their employees. Uh, they are seeing a lot of redundancies in office space and, and they've taken uh, a lot of measures to, to rectify this. Um, so so the issue with, you know, laying off and consolidating a lot of these facilities is that you incur a lot of one-off costs at the beginning, uh, but those costs have, seen kind of, have since kind of uh, run through. And so what we're seeing right now and what we hope to see moving forward, or what we expect to see moving forward is, is some sort of, by expansion in terms of operating leverage. Uh, so we have a buy rating on Alphabet with a target price of 144 US dollars. Next slide, please. Uh, so my next counter will be Tesla with the title Driving an Electric Future. I think it's no surprise that Tesla is up here. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they have superior products compared to a lot of its peers uh, and there's no shortage of demand for a lot of its uh, EVs. Well, not, not just EVs, but also its other energy uh, storage business as well. Um, uh, I know that that a lot of its wait times have actually been significantly reduced. Um, so you know, back in its peak when it was actually uh, building its factories and kind of starting to ramp up uh, you know, production, uh, you know, you wait about six to nine months for for a lot of its uh, vehicles. But for right now, I believe the wait time is down to about a month, or you can almost get it immediately. Uh, a big reason for this is not really a drop in a dip in demand, but it's more uh, a sharp increase in production to meet. Uh, the significant demand that, that consumers have had over the last few years. And we expect this to continue moving forward, um, mainly because you know they are essentially the leader in, in 
the EV space outside of China. Uh, the second point here is that Tesla actually has industry leading margins, so it's got gross margins of about 20, 18 to twenty percent, and this is more than uh, double the industry average, is about eight to nine percent. Um, how it manages to do this uh, is on several fronts. Firstly, it's able to control its costs a little bit better uh, by having a vertically integrated supply chain. Um, secondly, they've been able to uh, reduce its uh, cost for its batteries, which essentially batteries make up about a third of uh, of uh, EV manufacturing prices. Um, so if you're able to kind of through you know R and D and improving technology, uh, sort of sourcing the, the the available raw materials a bit more efficiently, you're kind of able to reduce the prices of your battery, uh, and, and that's kind of what we've been able to see uh, in terms of the average cost per EV, which is a, the chart here on the left. You can see over the last five, six years, um, average cost per EV has, has declined quite significantly, I believe like 40 plus percent from a peak of about 75,000 US dollars per, per car to right now it's hovering about 40,000 US dollars. So very significant um, decrease in cost per car, which uh, is good for Tesla because it makes it a bit more affordable. So if you as you're able to reduce the cost of your vehicles, you're able to kind of um, shift your your target audience. So right now, Tesla is still in kind of your um, it's not quite mass market prices, but it's still uh, slightly above your your affluent mass market. So uh, the main goal for Tesla is essentially to bring down prices further so that it can sell a car in the twenty five to thirty five thousand uh, US dollar range, which is your your mass market in the US. And, and obviously, if, if you kind of convert that into euro as well, which is a very big market, uh, it, it translates there as well. Uh, the last point we have is, 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 you know, it's more on the policy side of things with, with regulations and uh, government policies uh, kind of pushing this net zero emission. Uh, we think that this will be tailwinds for not just Tesla, but the overall EV industry moving forward, uh, especially as, as a lot of companies try to, to combat, uh, you know, I guess, increasing uh, CO2 emissions and stuff like that. Um, there are a lot of policies in place for not just consumers of, of these products, but also manufacturers uh, where uh, there are significant grants given by the governments to, to ramp up these production and to source, I guess, more sustainable ways of uh, uh, building automotive, automotive vehicles. Uh, so we think that, that given that a lot of these policies are uh, uh, very long data in nature, uh, we do think that, that it will be, be tailwinds for the foreseeable future for uh, Tesla as well as the rest of the EV industry. Uh, we have an accumulate rating on Tesla with a target price of $265. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so my next company will be Amazon. Um, and speaking of Amazon, it's mainly, you know, it has re it's mainly regarding their uh, efficiency enhancements, um, which it boils down to, you know, margin expansion. And we expect margin to continue expanding going forward. You can see the chart here on the left. Uh, there was a kind of a very sharp increase in, in margins over the last two quarters for uh, Amazon. Uh, and there's several reasons for this. Uh, firstly, with regards to its e-commerce business, um, uh, a lot of their, their costs is in uh, shipping. Uh, and so as you see, uh, you know, quite a significant easing in inflationary headwinds, uh, particularly in fuel prices, although this is not really the case in the last couple of months, but, but overall in, in general over the last couple of years, fuel prices have come down quite significantly. Uh, shipping rates have also shipping and freight rates have also come down quite significantly, and this has reduced uh, Amazon's cost to serve um, a lot of its customers. At the same time, they're also working quite quite hard on improving the efficiency of its uh, uh, logistics capabilities. So they are they are uh, not just on on the hardware front but software front as well. They are making it you know, making deliveries in a shorter amount of time. Um, and making deliveries more efficient so that their customers are able to get their packages uh, sooner uh, than before, so there are less delays. Uh, essentially, making that delivery service more efficient, um, and so improving you know overall efficiency for the whole company. Um, the second point that we have is that we think that AWS growth has actually stabilized, so it's come down quite significantly from its highs. Uh, you know, over the last few years, it was growing about forty plus percent a year on year. Uh, right now, it's come down to the high teens or, or low 20s, so something in the 20 to 25% year on year rate. Um, and I sat there for the last few quarters. And, and we think that uh, given the, 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 the substantial interest in generative AI, uh, this should help to benefit the AWS growth going forward. A uh, big reason is because you know a lot of companies that want to start investing in generative AI or have been investing in gen generative AI, uh, they do need uh, larger uh, cloud and data centers. 
internet center capabilities, uh, which ties into AWS uh, because AWS is, is as as a cloud provider, they are your your infrastructure provider, uh, and so they should and we expect them to continue seeing, uh, you know, high demand for its services. Uh, so we we think that you know generative AI should in the long term have to benefit AWS uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, and lastly, we want to talk a little bit about advertising, which is not really uh, talked about that much because it's still a very small portion of their overall business. Uh, but we think advertising is actually a big opportunity for for Amazon because uh, firstly they collect a lot of its own first party data, so you're kind of in, in some sense immune to a lot of uh, third party data regulations. At the same time, first party data is usually a little bit better. Uh, you can use it a little bit more efficiently, a bit faster, and, and more targeted compared to third party data. Um, so for Amazon, they they essentially collect you know all their consumers' data. Uh, Every item they click on, so they're able to to better target uh, advertisements. Uh, number one, and secondly, you know, whenever a customer actually sees most of their advertisements, they're already on your Amazon platform. Uh, so the initial to buy a click is very low because they're already looking for something to buy. And so, essentially, Amazon's uh, advertising strategy is just to push um, uh, and to cross sell some of the products that maybe go. It help to expand your your average basket basket size for for each consumer, uh, and and at the same time you you, uh, because of that you know you you're essentially earning higher margins on your digital advertising business, uh, and we think that moving forward, uh, this should get larger and larger. And it should help to to at least boost overall margins for Amazon. Uh, so we have a buy rating on Amazon with a target price of one hundred seventy five US dollars. Uh, next slide. Uh, my last counter will actually be on Nvidia, which you know it's not really. You know, Nvidia has been a talk of town for the last six months. Uh, they're still the leader in generative AI, and, and, and the biggest reason is you know we, we expect a very strong second half uh, of their fiscal year this year, which is second half twenty twenty four. It's not just us, but Nvidia is also guiding for almost a, a tripling of its revenue growth for the third quarter, which is uh, which has essentially just ended. So they're going to be expecting uh, they're going to be announcing this news you know during their earnings call value uh, soon. Um, you know, most of this growth growth is expected to be driven by uh, data center. Is data center business as uh, more cloud service providers kind of need more AI, so they're kind of, they're investing more in AI hardware, uh, which it is provided mainly by Nvidia because Nvidia produces uh, essentially the best chips in the world, uh, pretty much the the best and the only chips that a lot of these cloud service providers can actually use in their data centers. Um, to the work on uh, generative AI projects, um, so you know that, that is, they're basically almost a monopoly in this space. Um, and and secondly, which brings me to my, my next point is that we expect margins to expand for Nvidia, uh, mainly due to higher average selling prices of its uh, GPUs. Um, it, it said that they are selling their GPUs at almost uh, triple the price, uh, double to triple the price of their older GPUs. Uh, I mean, obviously they are they are significantly more. Uh, uh, and they have significantly high uh, performance, and they are a bit better in terms of uh, its construction. Uh, but you know, but the cost to actually manufacture these products isn't really uh, two to three times higher. So just by selling your your your, your GP your your, your higher end GPUs at a much higher price, you know, naturally you get see some sort of expansion in margins. Uh, and it's something we we expect to see moving forward, especially as uh, demand for a lot of generative AI uh, products continues. Uh, the last point we have here is we don't expect to see uh, uh, an immediate effect from, from some of the curbs on its Chinese business. Uh, even though China makes up about 20% of total revenue, uh, right now a lot of the demand uh, is not really coming from China. And so we should see a lot of this growth outside of China not really be affected. And and, and that's how we think that um, you know, this 20% maybe will start dwindling a bit lower. Uh, and it shouldn't really be, be that detrimental to its overall business and the overall revenue growth. Uh, we have a buy rating on Nvidia with a target price of six hundred forty-five uh, US dollars. Uh, so that's it for me. I hand it over to Ambrish to continue with the rest of the stock counter. Thank you. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. So moving on to my first topic, Microsoft. So uh, if we take a look at the chart, uh, uh, the blue line it highlights the intelligent cloud segment. So for Microsoft, we believe uh, there are two growth drivers. First of all, the intelligent cloud which includes its uh, Azure Cloud Service product. And secondly, the green line uh, 
which highlights productivity and business process segment. So this includes uh, the, the Office 365 productivity software and the number of users and revenue per user for both of them have been consistently rising. So for Azure, uh, uh, it's the fastest growing segment for Microsoft and it's the second largest cloud provider with a market share of about 23%. And it has doubled over the last five years or so. So uh, for Azure, uh, year on year revenue growth, we expect that to stabilize now. And for the September and that quarter, uh, we expect Azure revenue to grow by about 26% year on year. And uh, we believe that uh, this has been stabilized mainly because any uh, decline due to the lower IT spending by enterprises, uh, this has been offset by the growing contribution from AI. So like uh, for instance, uh, uh, if a particular company like uh, they have already uh, digitized their operations and uh, incorporated AI into their product base. So uh, they have to rely on cloud computing solutions like Azure in order to run a vast amount of data analysis and large amount of, uh, and to run the algorithms. So uh, for Azure, we believe that uh, it should get a boost from its uh, AI contribution from uh, uh, the cloud computing needs. And meanwhile, uh, in terms of its second thesis uh, uh, of uh, the productive in the productivity market, uh, Office Office 365, which includes Office 365 and Teams, Microsoft, uh, it has a market share of about 90%. And despite this uh, well, you, a significant market share, it's uh, 360 Office 365 uh, commercial revenue. It has been consistently rising. And uh, over the last few quarters or so, uh, it has been increasing by about 15 to 16% year on year. And we believe that this is mainly because of the uh, strong demand from uh, the small, small and medium enterprises and front-end worker offerings, as mainly uh, they rely on uh, the Office 365 tools in order to uh, for that, uh, manage their daily work tasks. Uh, and uh, Microsoft, it has also incorporated AI into its Office 365 so like uh, uh, the users, they can generate the first draft of presentations or uh, draft an email. So basically uh, the AI, it should also give a boost to its Office 365 uh, software. In terms of its risks for Microsoft, uh, we believe that the red line, uh, which is more personal computing segment, it has been uh, declining over the last uh, couple of quarters, three or four quarters. And this is mainly because of a weak personal consumer demand, a weak uh, demand for its, the personal computers. And, <coughs> sorry. And this is mainly impacting its uh, Windows and devices businesses. Like for instance, a Windows uh, segment, it includes uh, the Windows OEM revenue, which it generates from the, th the PC manufacturers like Dell who, who install Windows on their machines. And the devices segment, it mainly includes uh, sales of tablets and the PC accessories. So these are impacted with the weak PC sales. And uh, lastly for Microsoft uh, on Friday, they have closed their 69 billion uh, acquisition deal of uh, uh, Activision Blizzard uh, after the uh, lengthy review process. And we believe that uh, this should give a boost to its gaming business and uh, mainly through uh, uh, the, uh, the surge in number of users for Game Pass subscription service as well as uh, it should also lead to higher sales of its Xbox cons consoles. So uh, in terms of its uh, uh, contribution to its top line, we believe that it should provide a revenue boost of three to 4% year on year. So overall uh, for Microsoft, we have a, a accumulate recommendation and we have a target price of $372. Next slide, please. So, thank you. So moving on to the next uh, stock pick, which is Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb is basically an online marketplace for homestays and unique experiences. So uh, if you take a look at the chart, uh, it has already surpassed its pre-pandemic uh, uh, booking volumes. They have already surpassed the highs of, uh, uh, it has already reached a, a high of about 394 million bookings uh, as, and this has already surpassed its pre-pandemic levels. And we expect it to continuously uh, increase mainly because of shift to alternative accommodations and uh, the jump in travel. So Airbnb, uh, it's witnessing uh, uh, currently uh, three key trends. First of all, uh, the, uh, the guests, they are more into uh, cross-border international travels and uh, particularly Asia-Pacific regions. And this is mainly because of uh, the ease of COVID restriction after the 
ease of travel restrictions after the covid uh, pandemic and secondly guests are returning back to urban cities uh, and thirdly uh, it's witnessing uh, a long term stays of about 28 days or more they have been uh, resilient and this is mainly because of the flexibility due to remote work environment and uh, the the stays of more than 28 days they have contributed about like 18% of the total bookings volumes uh, which amounts to about 75 million uh, annually so uh, the surge in top top line as well as higher uh, operating leverage this has resulted into a higher uh, uh, net profit for airbnb so uh, last year in fy22 they have reported a maiden net profit of about uh, 2 billion us dollars and we expect that to continue to grow and moving on to our second thesis for airbnb uh, it's that uh, the supply or uh, the uh, the supply on airbnb's platform it has been consistently rising so in the june ended quarter uh, company reported that it has increased by about 19% year on year to 7 million active listings and we believe that this is mainly because of the continuous uh, product enhancements as well as providing support to hosts for instance uh, the recently they have introduced new pricing tools for host wherein they can have a look at the simil- the uh, renters that are charged by other hosts in the similar regions and accordingly they can uh, place the, the daily rentals so uh, and uh, and additionally they have also introduced airbnb rooms to uh, uh, to uh, like uh, wherein they can share the apartment from the the owner and Uh, in terms of risks for airbnb uh, we believe that uh, the daily rental rates they are expected to remain pressure uh, mainly because of business mix shift to urban regions so for instance uh, the urban region they have smaller spaces and as a result the the daily rental rates are, are on a lower side and this could impact the average daily rates uh, for airbnb and overall for airbnb we have a accumulate recommendation and a target price of 152 mainly because Uh, we believe that uh, it should benefit from the shift to alternative accommodations and it is more uh, group and travel friendly and also uh, since they are more spacious and uh, they are uh, they are as compared to ch- cheaper as compared to hotels so uh, moving on to my last topic next slide please uh, sales force so we have to title profit rises on cost cuts so uh, sales force it's basically a software as a service company and it generates uh, over 90% of its revenues through subscriptions so uh, in terms of the company in terms of its thesis the company it has been uh, uh, witnessing strong demand for its uh, products particularly uh, sales cloud and service cloud uh, so they basically help companies to uh, to manage and automate their sales task as well as to enhance customer relationships and uh, over the last few quarters the company it has been focusing on multi cloud uh, adoption strategy wherein uh, the company it's uh, cross selling its products to its existing customer base and uh, as a result uh, they would uh, they would increase their revenue and margin and uh, they would uh, reduce their uh, customer acquisition cost mainly because it's uh, currently focusing uh, to sell their products to their existing customers and uh, uh, and this is done mainly through their customer 360 platform wherein the customer data from the different segments they have been integrated into one platform and, and as a result the company it could get a holistic view of the customer information and in terms of its uh, uh, second thesis the company it uh, recently increased their price for most of its products by about 10% uh, in the in august and we believe this was the uh, first price hike in over last 7 years or so and since it has been consistently uh, adding in new features and uh, ai integration into its products uh, we believe that this should provide a top line uh, boost to its top line growth and uh, in terms of the last thesis for salesforce uh, it's uh, focusing on expanding its margin mainly because of uh, cost cutting uh, initiatives and uh, this has been done through uh, job layoffs and real estate consolidation so earlier this year uh, the company it had announced that uh, it would lay off about uh, 10% of its workforce so uh, this should give an uh, uh, boost to its uh, operating margin as well as net margin so overall for salesforce uh, uh, we have a accumulate recommendation and a target price of 242 dollars so uh, next slide please 
So uh, this is a, a US stock coverage list. And uh, I would now like to pass on to Glenn for Singapore Banking Monthly. Hey, thanks, Ambresh. Yeah, for the Banking Monthly, uh, yeah, we'll go straight to interest rates. Yeah, so the Singapore interest rates were rather flat and they continue to be flat this month as well. They were only up one basis point. So this is, this is similar to the increase the previous month and it rose to 3.7%. And it, nonetheless, it surged by 186 plus basis points year on year and it was also seven basis points higher than the three, three, third quarter average. And for the Hong Kong interest rates, it declined and slightly reversed the previous few months increase. So this is a sort of a continuation of the last two months, sorry, the last month. And, but nonetheless, this was still lower than the previous month's decline. So it only declined three basis points month on month this in September to 4.95%. This is lower than August's decline of 12 basis points. And this is also the third highest level that the three-month high ball has reached so far in 2023. The September streamer high ball was also improved by 197 basis points year on year, but it was six basis points lower than the third quarter average. So for the interest rates, what we do expect is that it might continue to, for the Singapore one at least, it might continue to grow at this single low single digit basis points month on month for at least the next few quarters. And for the Hong Kong interest rates, I think it will it, there's a possibility that it might decline further but it shouldn't be that drastic as compared to what happened in uh, about half a year ago. So now moving on to the next slide for the loans growth. Yeah, so for overall loans growth, it continued to fail and it fell by 6.71% year on year in August. So this was the highest uh, decline, year on year decline for loans growth that has been uh, recorded since MES changed their, their sort of their reporting so this was changed in about a year and a half ago. Yeah. So this 6.71% is the is sort of the highest decline. And this is mainly due to the continued high interest rates where the consumers start to feel it more and hence you know they, they sort of cut back on their loans growth, hence the decline. Well, for the business loans, it fell by 9.69% in August with the loans to the building and construction segment, which is the single largest business segment, falling by by 1.93% year on year. For the consumer loans, the it was down 1.73% year on year in August, as the dips in other segments were offset by strong loan demand in the housing segment. So housing loans actually, uh, which make up around 70% of the consumer loan lending, was the only segment that continued to grow, and it grew 1.05% year on year in August. For the total deposits and balances, it grew and it, it grew and it grew by 3.1% year on year with the current account and savings account or CASA proportion maintaining quite flat and it dips slightly by 0.1% to 18.8%. So this is quite good news for the Singapore banks as it means that their funding cost has been has been sort of um, stabilized at this 18 point uh, at this at this rate with the current account CASA ratio sorry maintaining at 18.8 18.9%. So okay now moving on to the left side okay so I think there's a question uh, saying that the Hong Kong loan growth yeah so for long Hong Kong loans growth, we put a chart, but for the Singapore loans growth, it is a uh, sort of figures. So for the Hong Kong loans growth, it has declined by 4.46% year on year and also fell 0.28% month on month in August. And the year on year decline in loans growth for August was lower than the decline in, slightly lower than the decline in July. Now moving on to the next slide. Yeah, regarding the SGX statistics. So for the SGX statistics, the SDAV uh, for September fell 27% year on year to 858 million. With the this is the largest year on year decline in four months. And the VIX averaged 15.2 in September, which is down uh, from 15.9 in the previous month. While the DDAV rose 3% year on year and 3% month on month in September. For the top four equity index futures turnover, it saw a decline of 17.1% year-on-year in September. And this was mainly due to lower trading volumes of the Nikkei 225 index switches as well as the MSCI East Singapore index switches. And notably, the Nikkei 225 futures actually did rise month-on-month -month by 20.5%, while the FTSE China A50 index switches fell by 24.8% month-on-month. And this is for September. Now, moving on to the next slide. 
Yeah. So we have uh, put a, a short of a, a short summary of the local banks' uh, Greater China exposure. I think there are some questions about this. So you know we couldn't uh, put it just solely the mainland China or Hong Kong because they don't. Some of the banks don't separate, so it's a bit hard to collate the information. So we combined it and it's the, the just the Greater China exposure for the banks. So you can see that you know for profit before tax, it's quite low at around only around sixteen percent. And the loans is uh, less than a quarter at around 24% for all three banks. And for deposits, it's even lower. So it's below 9%, uh, below 10% at 9%. I think for the one, the bank with the greatest exposure, it will be OCBC. And it's not a surprise as they are mentioning time and time again that they are trying to uh, push ahead in, in China. But it's also relatively low with you know, both profit before tax and loans at less than a quarter of their total. And you know, deposits is also around 10% only. And UB also has the least exposure <clears throat> with yeah, profit before tax only at 3%. You know, and the loans uh, deposits also around 6%. I think also quite expected, you know, they are concentrating more on the ASEAN and Singapore and local markets. Yeah, so DBS is somewhere in between, you know. Yeah. So that's for the local for the local banks with the China exposure. Now moving on to the next slide. Oh yeah, sorry. I'll just touch upon uh, a bit about the banking news that has happened, some highlights that has happened in Singapore for September. So I think the main news is that the GXS uh, Bank has actually announced that they have uh, gotten approval from the Malaysian uh, Malaysia to sort of uh, uh, yeah, to get their digital bank license in Malaysia. So it's under their GX Bank, which is GX Bank Bahad. And this was at the start of September. And also the MES announced that the they have approved, uh, sort of, yes, gone through um, that the deposit insurance coverage will be increased from 75,000 to 100,000. And this will take effect on 1st April 2024. Also, there was, um, they have also mentioned that, the MES also mentioned that they are also looking further into whether the banks involved in the 2.4 billion money laundering scandal has taken all reasonable steps to mitigate risk. So I think they're trying to find out um, whether where to maybe whether they have you know sort of tried their best to stop this money laundering and if not we might see further um further sort of uh, further mitigants you know where they will imply for the banks and lastly uh both UOB and DBS have announced uh, greater controls aimed at protecting their customers against uh, malware and able scams so they have rolled out new security features and this is following what OCBC has done in the previous month. Yeah, so as such, we maintain overweight on the Singapore uh, on the banking sector and remain positive on banks. And the bank dividend yields are also attractive with upside surprises due to excess capital ratios as well as a push towards the higher ROEs. And the stable economic conditions as well as rising interest rates remain tailwinds for the banking sector. So that's all I have for the banking sector. I'll now hand it over to Darren for the reads. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, so for the REITs, we issued a report uh, last week. We have a title repositioning for a Fed pause because right now we think it could be a good time to start uh, repositioning your portfolio into REITs for the dividend you play, yeah, especially since uh, the forward yield is uh, yeah, next slide, please. It's, it's growing. Yeah, so for this uh, slide, it's actually the uh, 10-year dividend you spread. So the you spread basically means how much you are being compensated when you invest in REITs on a dividend uh, you uh, per se divided uh, minus the 10-year uh, Singapore government bonds. So the 10-year Singapore government bonds is like a risk proxy that we use or risk-free rate proxy. So right now you can see it's trading at a uh, minus 1.4 cent evasion away from the, the mean. So it's, at, uh, it's fallen to about 3%, but this is mainly due to the recent spike in the Singapore government, the 10 years to 3.4%. So uh, going forward, we think that this 10-year uh, yield will, will soften and you, you can expect that the you spread to widen uh, to perhaps only uh, towards the, the mean where this we think it could be a good opportunity. And uh, the recent performance of REITs was mainly affected by the, after the FOMC meeting in September. So the share prices were down about 5% or even more uh, in the last two weeks of September due to the higher for longer stance that uh, the Fed came out with. Uh, but on a one-on-one -on -one basis, in September, it was down 3.2%. So the performance, uh, mainly for industrials, it was 
uh, held out the best. So industrials is the only sector year to date that is still positive in the returns. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, some reasons why we think that uh, right now could be a good time to invest in SREITs is because, uh, first of all, the forward dividend yield right now is at 6.4%, is at uh, 0 0.5 times standard division above the mean of about 6 or 6.1%. And then the right the, the price to NAV as well for the index is also trading way uh, below COVID lows. Right now it's at minus two standard deviation, so it's at zero point eight six times. So, uh, as we believe that the uh, the price to NAV will most likely uh, trade back towards its uh, historical mean over time. Yeah, so this uh, could be a good opportunity. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So for the subsectors. We still prefer the hospitality subsector, mainly because we believe this uh, is the only sector that possibly can generate a deep growth going forward because of the increase in revenue can more than offset the, any increases like forward forex headwinds or the interest rate uh, increases. So right now you see the visitor arrivals is uh, year on year it grew 44.6% and China, it grew uh, about 10 times uh, year on year, but it's still about 55% of pre-COVID. So there's still a lot of uh, way for the China visitor arrivals to improve as the flat capacity increases. And right now for the ref bar is at uh, all time highs. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's down uh, on a month-on-month -month basis due to seasonality, but it is still uh, all time high. We look at a purely at the month. So year on year, the ref bar growth is at 26.5%. And uh, hotel uh, room rates are still at uh, uh, are still at all time highs as well at 284. So, so this is way above uh, any uh, pre-COVID. And then uh, going forward, Singapore is a nice hub and entertainment hub in the in the region, right? Yeah, all this will help to boost all these rapper numbers as well as visitor arrivals going forward. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, another sector that you like is the retail sector. So for retail, we see there's a resilience there because of the, the RSI right now is at 3.7%. A uh, year on year, so it's it's still growing. It, uh, of course, it has slowed from uh, from uh, as in last year year on year growth. It was double digit. Like you see the August twenty two number for the retail sales index was very high at sixteen point percent, but that's mainly because of a higher base from the weak uh, very weak twenty uh, twenty one numbers. So right now the the retail sales index, uh, excluding motor vehicles, it has stabilized or rather normalized at three point seven percent. We still see a lot of uh, strong demand coming from the food and alcohol segment. Uh, yeah, especially from the alcohol segment where it was up about 24%. Because I, uh, many people started drinking more after they see the, the market, I guess. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, yeah, but then uh, because of this resilience in this uh, RSI, right, we see that the potential for rental reversions going forward is also there. Like for suburban malls, the recovery for the rental reversions is it was quite early, and uh the the downtown malls, the rental reversions were negative until early this year. But then, uh, going forward, because of the increase in visitor arrivals, we expect that, like especially the Chinese tourists they are back to Singapore, we expect that the downtown malls can get a quite good positive rental reversions going forward. While the retail malls, because of its resilience and the, the stable uh, retail sales index, we can expect uh, maybe low single digit rental reversions for some of the most going forward. So because uh, of this, we, we select the retail sector as well. Uh, for industrial sector, we are neutral, mainly because of the good share price performance. So the retail, uh, as I mentioned just now, that the industrial subsector, the year to date price is up 2.2% uh, while the other sectors are down. And uh, because of this uh, strong share price performance, the Forward dividend yield is about six percent. So this six percent is lagging the average of six point four percent. So right now, if you invest in uh industrial streets, you are kind of getting a, a lower yields compared to the other the other industry, the other sectors. But then we we do know that the industrial sector is still strong, especially uh there's a lot of demand coming from the third party logistics as e-commerce is still strong and and the warehousing as well as the circular growth from uh. The new economy tenants such as a uh, high spec science business parks. Yeah. And for the office sector, we are, we are neutral as well, as well. Uh, mainly because uh we think that rents have peaked at around eleven eighty. And 
because of a lot of new supply coming up into the market in 2024, like from IOI Central Boulevard and the Capital South Central. So that is about almost 2 million uh, square foot of uh, supply in office space coming into Singapore. So because of that, we think that the uh, rents could soften. Yeah, and uh, right now, um, the cap rates for office also in Singapore is about 3.5%. So we are getting a negative carry for office properties. Yeah, that's why we are so uh, not too bullish on the office sector. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so this is our coverage. Yeah, uh, we have accumulate call on most and, and buy call. Yeah, uh, and we have a neutral call on capital DC. Um, we, we look at prime US, uh, the total return is very high, but that's because of the, the share price right now is very volatile because of the, the US side. And some some peers also are having uh, some some headwinds. And the uh, US commercial market is not doing too good now. Yeah, that's why the, the share price is volatile, but in the long run, we think there is some value there. Yeah, so uh, that's all for me. I'll hand over time to Sane. Thanks. Thanks, Darren. Uh, I'll move on to the technicals. Okay, so for the S&P 500, last week we saw uh, a rebound and some sideways action afterwards. So it looks like there's some resistance upon the retest of this um, here and shoulders neckline over here. So if we do continue on to, to, to face the resistance over here, we could see some sort of pullback and consolidation this week. So for now, the immediate resistance could lie between 4,370 to about 4,430, while the support could be between 4,220 to about 4,270. Okay, then for individual counters, we have uh, Tesla. So we have a technical sell at $256.63, take profit level at $239, uh, stop loss at $265.40, the stock last close at $251.12 on Friday. So for Tesla, uh, it has been showing some uh, decreasing momentum. Uh, price has been facing resistance along this downtrend resistance line over here as well as uh, looks like there could be a repeat of uh, what happened in end, end September where we had a bearish red break round over here. So um, Friday, we had a bearish closing uh, as well. So that potentially price could come and retest the $239 level, which was a swing low support uh, from uh, recently. When you look at the momentum indicators like or MACD and RSI, they are also, so they are also, also showing um, decreasing momentum with lower highs being formed. So that's all from me now. I'll pass on the time to Paul to talk about Singapore. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks, Dean. Uh, next slide. So you uh, just run through the usual macro news that came in Singapore and, and, and uh, US. So, uh, so we had the MES um, uh, announcing a couple of data points. Uh, firstly, GDP. Uh, most of it won't really affect the stock market, but uh, just for info purpose. Uh, the GDP improved 0.7 compared to uh, second quarter. Uh, they actually did comment that that uh, they actually uh, lowered their uh, their GDP forecast of 2023, 0.5 to one compared to in April was 0.5 to uh, 2.5. Uh, their comment is that they are expecting recovery for Singapore economy in the second half of 24. Uh, core inflation not not much changes. Uh, most important is the monetary policy statement. Uh, our, of course, uh, Singapore doesn't raise interest rates, but we will adjust our uh, where we see the Singapore exchange rate. So, uh, by the default setting for MAS is always to maintain the prevailing rate of appreciation. Uh, so they're continuing with that. There's no change in the width, uh, which is the the range that they want to move the exchange, or no change into the centering. So centering means it's like you get up or you get down, and it's usually the most aggressive uh, move by the MAS. So uh, I'll, uh, we'll have a chart later and explain more. Uh, then we had some data on exports, which we always monitor just to get a sense of uh, electronics exports. So Taiwan exports uh, has actually started to, to grow, uh, the first growth in almost 13 months. And also we see some stability in Korean exports. So it's uh, weakening less, I guess. Uh, we had some uh, US data. The most important was uh, inflation. So inflation was generally in line with expectations. Uh, actually, apart from fuel, uh, it's encouraging that most of the... Uh, components of CPI or inflation actually is uh, stable or it's still trending downwards. There was some FOMC meeting minutes. So on the September 20th meeting, 
uh, there was they usually have a minute of what was discussed during the FOMC. Of course, it's a, it's almost like a press statement. Uh, they obviously know the investment community will read this, and the way to message out to so. Uh, some of the key messages was that uh, the majority of the, of the FOMC participants actually still think that there should be one more rate hike either in November or December. Uh, while of course some say no more, no further. Uh, but since then, uh, I think the bond markets has really re jumped up almost 27 basis points since that meeting. So uh, for us, at least how we read it is that even without the FOMC raising rates, I think the bond markets have already kind of raised rates uh, on, on its own. Uh, the other comment that was made in the FOMC minutes was that they, they should shift from how high to, that means how much more to raise rates to how long they intend. So this is a positive thing because it will shush, it will just suggest to the market that uh, the Federal Reserve is moving towards a, a pause stance. And so so that is a, a, a positive move. That means they are re ready to pause in terms of raising interest rates. Uh, next slide. So, uh, okay, uh, in terms of our technical views, in terms of the Israel conflict, obviously we don't have any any special insight. We're going to just share what the consensus view is. So long as uh, the conflict is contained, uh, there's no spillover into crude oil, then there'll be no spillover into crude oil prices and then uh, global inflation. Uh, even the Israeli stock market has actually gone sideways for the last five days. I think the most important uh, info, the news was that the US said there was no direct evidence that uh, Iran was involved. So I mean, it's a bit unusual. Again, who who knows about all these things? But because Iran was still waiting for the six billion payment from the US, uh, to try and make this such a aggressive uh attack, uh, a, a bit less logical, I guess. But again, uh, this is our own view. Uh, in terms of the uh, other implications for the market, would be there be of course, uh, high security alertness, and it will be a uh, positive for defense spending, uh, like ST engineering. Uh, we also put uh Starhub there because Starhub has a huge uh. Um, a huge cybersecurity arm which actually services a lot of the, the, the gov government departments and agencies. Uh. It's called Ensign of under Starhub. So that's why we, we strangely put a Starhub inside here. So in terms of our our other uh, tactical views uh, that uh, for S3s we were we were we were early. I think we, we always had an overview on S reads because uh for us it was a relative up performance bet because we thought that growth was slowing down. So we thought that that would be one way to shelter out. Uh, but of course, with the recent hikes, that it has hurt the S rates. Like what uh, Darren mentioned, it was down. I think almost six uh, percent for the third quarter. Uh, but we are still we think uh, any there could be a rally in in uh in reads in the second half. So th the way how we read it, at least the sequencing is that first. I mean, you have to start off with the with the Fed uh, pausing. Then if once the Fed pause, then the market will start to price in monetary easing cycle. Uh, we think, I mean, we guess, I guess, uh, will be probably the middle of next year if growth starts to slow. Then once the market starts to price in uh, uh, more aggressive, um, more certainty that there'll be rate cuts, then there will be a triple boost or triple kicker to reach share prices. Uh, of course, the yields will be more attractive than bonds. Uh, then the REITs will have enjoyed lower interest expenses. And then their in their valuations will increase as the cap rate compressed. Uh, of course, very obvious. This is what this is affecting them right now. In, instead of a triple boost, these are the triple headwinds that all the risks are facing. Uh, so the yields are less attractive, higher interest rates. But all this can reverse if you get if you enter into this uh, monetary easing cycle. I mean, that's, that's that's our point of view. For electronics, when you look at the data, th there could be some trading opportunity because there's some stability, but. Uh, again, this is purely on inventory replenishment. So just a reminder, you know, demand for electronics is either inventory replenishment and end demand improving. But we're only having one. We don't really see end demand improving. It's just inventory because their customers have kind of shared inventory too much. So now they're just rebuilding inventory. Uh, but again, we still think that uh, third quarter results are going to be weak. Uh, I'll show you a, a chart later. So in terms of the events, there's quite a lot of events this week. Uh, this week, uh, we have uh, like US retail sales with Goldman Sachs results, Netflix, Tesla, Morgan Stanley, and then on the 19th we got Powell making some comments. And then this week we have I think Capital Pacific. Uh, no, feel free to join us if you have the time. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, so in terms of electronics, you can uh, so ignore the title here. There's a, there's a, a, a typo here. Uh, it's not Refpa. Uh, so if you look at the chart on the left, so these are Korean and Taiwan exports. So you're beginning to see some bottoming up here. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, of course, it makes us a bit nervous whether how much can it, it still it still requires a strong end demand. So like we mentioned before, we think any recovery could be muted. It could be more like a 2012, 2013 kind of low single digit kind of export sector. Uh, because our view is still that uh, the US will still slow down in 2024. Uh, global semiconductor sales is also declining less. But again, the recovery path for us is still underway. But at the very least, there's still there's some bottoming underway in electronics. Uh, the pace of recovery is unclear. Huh? Next slide. Then, uh, of course, the electronic sector actually had a rally, I think, because of Samsung guidance is better, and they say things have bottom, has bottom. But it, uh, but they're still guiding for a thirteen percent drop in revenue, and you'll notice the red line here on the left. So this revenue, this is the what the consensus forecast is, uh, that in the third quarter is a bit hard to see, but maybe it'll be flat, and then there'll be like five to six percent growth in the first quarter. Uh, this is what the market forecasting. Uh, but for the third quarter, we still expect uh, results to be weak because if you look at Honhai, which is one of the, the largest contract manufacturer, likewise for UCI, uh, their revenues are still down. So this are, why we use Taiwanese because Taiwanese are the only ones that provide monthly sales numbers. So you notice that on the chart on the right, that it's still declining. Uh, the red line is Honhai and the blue line is still UCI. So these are the two large uh, contract manufacturers and it's still weak in September. So this is just to get the most uh, freshest number that we can get. Uh. Next slide. Then, uh, okay, this is a very noisy chart, but uh, we, we use this, don't know, for many years, but this one is just to show you the, the MES. This is more for, I don't know, for, for you to understand. I mean, it's not going to impact the stock market that much. But uh, what the, the MES does is that they always focus on this and nominal effective exchange rate, the blue line. So this is basically a basket. They never review the basket, but it's a basket compared to trading partners. So inside there is, they will measure whether they want to appreciate against ringgit, uh, China, US, uh, and so not, not so much US because we don't really export much yeah I, I guess it's US too but not as much but it will be the RMB and the ASEAN countries uh, so usually you get the white space you see this white space with the line here increase slightly so this is the default setting for MES they always want to increase their exchange rate uh, but in certain times uh, when the economy is weak uh, you will notice this green bar here zero appreciation or light green uh, this is when they won't increase because the economy is weak uh, then you see zero appreciation. Uh, likewise, in of course, the pandemic, they did that. And then uh, during the uh, global financial crisis, 2008, 2009. Uh, then when they are very aggressive, that means when inflation is high, you'll notice the, the blue bar here, they will say recenter upwards. That means the, that's the most aggressive move. So you see the dark blue line will spike up because that's when MES want to appreciate the currency even stronger, usually to fend off uh, uh, inflation. Uh, but uh, the, the other point here is that since the the change in monetary policy since April, you can see the NER increased by 1.2%, but the US dollar doesn't. So it doesn't mean that when the when they raise means the US dollar, US dollar has its own dynamics. Uh, but this is against the, the currency. But again, this is just for your understanding of how MES conducts monetary policy. It's not going to affect anyone's stock market uh, share, price, uh, share prices or anything. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, this is just the last one. So we always monitor now the inflation is so important. So this is, I uh, know it's a very noisy chart, uh, but it, this is where inflation, so the red line is inflation. Uh, then you notice uh, most of the, one encouraging thing is that most of the, of the components are sliding down. Uh, most important is services, then you have sheltered the black line. But the one that popped up is energy because of oil prices. So our view is still that uh, inflation is still going to trend downwards. Uh, it's continue to trend downwards and uh, but the headline CPI, which is, I guess, less important for the Fed because they, they don't look at uh, dust is core inflation excluding fuel. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is my last slide. Just so we, there was an analyst briefing on the upcoming IPO. It's called Sheffield Green. Uh, uh, it's a very unique, uh, doesn't mean interesting, uh, just a very unique IPO. So their market cap is 47 million. Uh, they are a HR company. That means they will. They are like an, any HR executive search headhunting company, but they specialize in offshore wind renewable sector. Uh, they are part of a larger group called Sheffield Energy that focus on oil and gas. So they are offering twenty four million shares at twenty five cents. Uh, they are raising six million. Uh, forty percent of what they raise is going to listing expense. So I guess I don't know whose IPO this is, but anyway, it's their, most of the money, almost half of it, doesn't go to them. I guess. Uh, what they do is they do training, payroll, tax compliance. 
Uh, but they are more in the technical roles. So some of the names that we all know, uh, I guess it's not here, but like Jobs3, Adeco, those are more the non-technical roles, but they are, theirs is more technical. technical. Uh, they are, they are, most recent nine months saw earnings spiked up because they broke even last year and then now it's up 2.4 million US. Uh, they are revenue up, I think mainly because they said it's from the Taiwanese contract. Uh, our own comments is it's a bit subscale to IPO when you have only Two million, of course, still money about two million because you no. Know, once you IPO, you're going to get hit by you know three types of expenses. You have the listing expense. Uh, no, then you have to uh, you have a new then you because you are a catalyst, you have a sponsor expense. Then now you have to have the director's expense. So all this could creep up. Uh, I'm just guessing a number, almost like a million, and this could could shave up a large part of the earnings. So sometimes you're a bit subscale to grow, but uh, again, uh, this is uh, this is just a uh, this is just for information purpose uh, because this is a. Uh, we don't have much IPOs anyway. So this is the one that's to give brief everyone. So in conclusion, it's a niche HR company. Uh, okay, thanks everyone. I think we can move on to Q&A. Thanks. Hey, yep. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I think I'll take the, the this one regarding DBS. I think it's quite a hot topic now. Yeah, so for those who, who, who don't know what's ha what happened over the weekend, I think I think most Singaporeans will know what happened. Uh. I mean, I I myself also personally felt the the disruption. So over over the weekend, I think um it was uh DBS had this very bad disruption for more than half a day. Excuse me, I need to sorry. Okay. Um. Yeah. Sorry, I need to sneeze. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah. So they they had this very bad uh, disruption. So I think it was it was a whole range of things that couldn't be used. I mean, up to it was their uh their app. You know, their internet banking couldn't be used. I think even pay now, pay la, uh, all couldn't be used. And I think even some I myself personally couldn't use my credit card. Right. So and there there were other people who also said they couldn't use their physical card for purchases online or or at stores. So it was quite a bad uh, disruption. And this is like the fourth one that has happened to them in the recent times, right? Third or fourth one. So I think, you know, th this question asks for the most recent uh, internet, DBS internet disruption, businesses reported 10% loss in sales. Which agency will bear the brunt of this loss? And uh, okay, the so, so they also asked about the capital DC. I think I'll leave that to Darren. So for the first one, I think, I, I'm really uncertain which agency will bear the loss. I I, I think you're mentioning whether the 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 shop the shop owners, you know, or the businesses will bear the loss or will DBS, you know, sort of uh, refund them. I think it'd be quite hard to to see um DBS being able to refund the businesses because you know it's it's not an a, absolute amount for them to sort of uh, um give it back, you know, refund the customers. So what will happen most likely is that which I mean, DBS has suffered this before, and you know, we, at least we have historic data to look at. So, what will happen is that MAS would possibly impose an an additional another additional capital requirement to, to DBS. So the previous one was around one point eight times of their risk weighted assets, you know, and in September and October, which is the other two that DBS suffered, they have haven't yet imposed any additional uh additional capital requirements. So this 1.8 times was for their November 2021, March this year and May this year. So for the last two in September and October and now this recent one in December, they haven't they haven't said anything yet. So what will happen to this is that there's a possibility that this will eat into their into their capital, excess capital. So they said that their excess capital in May, I think, during their, their investor day or digital day, it was 3 billion. So if they do add an added more additional capital requirement, this could cut down their excess capital to possibly two billion or one billion. And you know, this might also affect their their, their dividend payout, right? Because that they were basing their additional, I think 24 cents a year increase was based on this additional excess capital which they had, which was three billion. So it's really uncertain. It's very hard to say uh what will happen until MAS comes out with with the with sort of their penalties. Uh. Yeah. And I think okay, so there's another two things, you know, the the main one is the loss of reputation. Clearly, uh, a lot of people were affected, and you know, they might, and this is not the first time, you know, first time, you know, it's not even the third time, this is like a fourth time. So, you know, their customers might 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 want to shift 
to other banks, but it's also very hard to say. So, you know, but what we can say for certain is that they will definitely need to boost their their digital capabilities and especially just ensure that it works, right? So this would might, might sort of translate to an increase in expenses for them, for DBS, not only just to uh, improve their baseline, which is their, their tech capabilities, but they might also need to um, sort of spend more money to, to retain the customers uh, because now customers are feeling a bit, uh, they're feeling a bit um, sort of uh, uh, uncertain, you know, whether or not that day they can use their card or their app, right? So these expenses might increase further. Yeah, so I think I think these are the two or three main things that will happen to 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 DBS. But it's really hard to to predict what will happen because everything is uh, is, is is moving, everything is fluid. So we just have to wait and see and see what will happen. Yeah, I I'll let Darren answer the one about the Capital DC read whether they bear any liability. I I'm not very sure about that. Uh, let me see if I have any other questions. I think there was one about the, the Hamas and the Israel war, whether it will affect uh, the banks. I, I don't I think it's a bit too far to affect the, the banks, at least Singapore banks, uh, right? For the US and local US and the local markets, or maybe I'll leave that to, to Paul to answer that. Yeah, so that's all I have for the banking sector. I'll now hand it over to the rest of my colleagues. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. So I have a couple of questions here on uh, Tesla. Um, essentially, the first question is, did not catch your repeating a Tesla at new target price. Can you repeat? Uh, the second question is, uh, the TV for Tesla is still high given the poor results, sales, and volume over the last few months. May I know the yeah, so actually, a TP for Tesla two hundred sixty five dollars. Um, we initiated coverage, I believe, in the middle of August, and actually, it has, the the price actually hit our target price um a few weeks ago. Uh, but anyway, when it comes to their yeah, poor results, uh, or, or quote unquote poor results, because they they actually announced their third quarter deliveries and production numbers, and and that was, um. Uh, quite significantly lower than expectations. But the interesting thing was, um, well, we weren't really sure why consensus estimates were so high in the first place because Tesla already mentioned in their earnings call, the pre their second quarter earnings call, that they were going to have a significant drop off because a number of their factories had actually uh, were actually planning to go on a, a, a retooling and upgrading. So naturally, when you're retooling and, and upgrading your facilities, you kind of have to shut production down. Uh, not all of it, but but you know a, a large portion of it. So, uh, it, it wasn't really unexpected. Uh, I guess the uh, you know consensus was just a little bit more um, optimistic on these numbers. Yeah, but but it, essentially the, the company already told everyone that uh, to to expect sales numbers and and, and production numbers to drop. Uh, yeah. Uh, when it comes to our TP, you know it's a one year, oh, it's a one year TP. So. Uh, it, it's already factored in uh, some of the production numbers and delivery numbers and, and so on. Uh, even I, I guess the the uh, when it comes to some of their margin contractions over the last couple of quarters is really kind of factored. In. Yeah, and if you look at the price right now, I think it's about six or seven percent above. Uh, the target price is about six or seven percent above um, the actual closing price on Friday. I don't think it's. Uh, significantly it's around about you know where where the, the price has been, has been hovering over the last two months yeah uh, so hope that this is your question uh, i think that's all for me i'll hand it over to this michael thank you uh sorry maybe i just jump in here quickly because there was another uh, comment on the on the dbs thing yeah so someone uh, someone said any thought on mes penalties on DBS's outage over the weekend is premature, as from reports, it seems that the disruption originated from outsourced data center outside outside of DBS's control. Yep. So as I mentioned earlier, is everything is quite fluid. So you know, MES will take their time to to see what what they have, uh, what has happened. You know, and then they'll probably do a report on it. And you know, they need to sort of you know, they'll take quite a long while. Uh. And I think also because if you look at what happened in September and October? They still haven't imposed any any fines yet, right? They haven't come out to say what, what, what are the what are the, what are the sort of 
uh, in, uh, penalties that they're going to give to DBS. So, you know, this the penalty that they might come up with, right, at, at the end of all this, it might also be accumulated from what happened in September and October. Right. Yeah. So I guess for the for the MAS penalties, you know, this this might just be an accumulation of what has happened over the past half a year, at least from the last from May onwards. Yeah. And also, I mean, I also thought about the expenses thing. I think that that is something that they cannot avoid. Like. They probably would have they definitely would have to to uh, uh spend more on, on on trying to retain customers now than they they did before all these uh, uh technical difficulties they faced. I hope that answered the question. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Yeah, there's a question on the war again. So, um, I'll leave the more macro picture to I don't know, Peggy, but uh, what I can say how you affect the REITs is that um, for for REITs, right now the Singapore REITs have any properties in Israel, so yeah, they are not uh, directly impacted. But then, if you ask about indirect, like uh, other factors like all these uh rising costs or this, yeah, I think Paul or Peggy will be better to answer that. Yeah, but uh, REITs do not have any. Uh, assets in Israel, so no direct impact. Uh, yeah, there's a, a kind of a, a question or a, uh, any suggestion on stocks to purchase if I'm looking for stable dividend payment of 4 to 6% per year with not uh, much fluctuation in stock prices. Yeah, so we, we think you could uh, maybe slowly invest into REITs or like a uh, FCT or Capital and Scott Trust has paying about five to six percent, and the share price is not as volatile as the other, a lot of uh, some other reads. Uh, Capital and Scott Trust, the, the share price dropped, uh, recently, mainly because of the rights issue. Yeah, but other than that, the, the share price usually is, is not as volatile as some of the smaller peers. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave this question also up there. Um, but if you are a very risk adverse investor. Maybe you could uh, look into uh, maybe the, the government bonds uh, or T-bills where they are paying about 3 to 4%. You get slightly lower yield, but um, at least it's uh, risk-free. Yeah, hi, Paul and Tima. The outlook for S is given higher for longer rates and the pending escalation. Yeah, so which re sectors we think will be more resilient? Yeah, like I uh, mentioned in the in my presentation earlier, uh, we think that uh, the retail Maybe because of the stable retail numbers as well as hospitality will, will really uh, be more resilient as uh, hospitality can drive DPU growth and retail, we still see uh, quite a strong story for the uh, positive rental reversions going forward. Yeah, so we, we like these two uh, subsectors. Um, Any uh, outlook on Prime or Manulife US Street? This thing as well. Yeah, so uh, I'll start with Manulife. So for Manulife right now, the issue is that they need to, of course, they need to seek the waiver and then they are in discussions with the banks as and sponsor the whole committee to, to uh, kind of solve their, their issue because they hit the uh, uh, bank covenants of 60%. So now they're trying to solve the issue. Um, but the, the issue now is they need to kind of seek the waiver and it's a whole package thing. That's why it's taking a very long time for them to get any, uh, to, to give any updates. But we do hope we get some updates in the third quarter results. So for Manulife right now, it's more of a bet that they will be able to solve their, their issues if you invest in them right now, rather than a US office recovery. Because Manulife, their share price has really dropped to, I, I think uh, four cents if I'm not wrong. So there's, because they hot they hotted dividends as well, so the price is very weak for menu life. And they have invested in menu life right now. It's it's just a bet that they can get the waiver and they can uh, slowly uh, solve that the issues with the liquidity and such. There not so much a, a recovery in in the U.S. office. Yeah, and and for Prime U.S. REIT, we are keeping a lookout. Um, there's a follow up question also. Uh, Prime is still a buy. Why is it still a buy? How do you see Prime pay up? Uh, play out in the mid to long term. Yeah, so for Prime, we have a target price of uh, 39 cents. Yeah, so uh, this is a uh, uh, one year out. Yeah, so it's, it's not a near term play where we see the price will recover very fast. And then one way we see Prime right is 
if you use the total debt that they have and we add it to the market cap, it's still about a 50 over percent discount to the investment property value. So we don't think this, uh, this discount to the investment property value is justified for Prime, which is also why we still have a buy call. Even though Prime is uh, trading at a price value of 0.15 times. Yeah, but if you just look at the debt and market cap and you add it, it's still much, it's still a heavy discount to the property, investment property value. Yeah, so, and then we first also factored in that a Prime's uh, occupancy may dip to around 80%, but all these have been factored in into our calculation of uh, dividends. So right now, at current prices, you're still seeing a 30-40% dividends. Yeah, so that is why we still have a buy. And our mid to long-term outlook of, yeah, it's about, it's, uh, it's of one year, our, our share type, but it's not a near-term play. Yeah, but we, we are keeping a lookout on, of course, for Prime, the office valuations and whether they'll be able to refinance their debt. So these are the two big ones. So if any good news happens, like if they manage to refinance the debt, we, we do see that Prime share price could recover quite a bit. If the MS uh, basis tends to strengthen the SGD, isn't it bad for REITs overall? Yeah, so when MS is strengthened, the SGD, you, the, the REITs will be hit by FX. Because uh, when they convert back to SGD, uh, yeah, um, you, you get lesser when, when you convert the foreign currencies. Yeah, so uh, they will hit by FX, but some of this uh, impact is mitigated when the REITs hedge their, their forecasted income. Yeah, but overall, this will a strength of SGD will affect the foreign source of income for, for the REITs. Uh, about starting to top up on REITs now, there was a report this morning Fed officials prepared to extend rate pause without saying hikes are done. So it's now a good time or wait till Fed stop hiking. Yeah, so because of the presentation earlier, we mentioned that the price of NAV now is cheap and the forward dividend yield is also above the average. So you're getting more dividend uh, yield on the current prices. We think it's a good time to slowly pile up. Of course, there are still many headwinds. We, we do not expect uh, much DPU growth with the exception of hospitality subsector. It's because of the high interest rate. So we think uh, DPU might be flattish. Yeah, so, but, but we are in it like on a relative basis, like just for the, the dividend yield, like uh, about 6% dividend yield, you think is uh, justified and it's a good uh, dividend yield play. Yeah, and then we also do not want to wait until the Fed like stop hiking and they, they have uh, fixed when they're going to kind of decline where, where there's certainty because by then the share prices might have already moved already, might have already recovered. And then if you want to buy then, Maybe it might be too late. So you think it might be good to start uh, slowly topping up reads for now. Uh, with regards to actually, could you share the table comparison research cost of funding? Uh, since interest, uh, yeah, percentage hedging since interest rate moved considerably in the recent past and have different reads have different hedging strategies. Yeah, so. I actually have a table, a full table of all the S universe, like the percentage of debt hedge, their whale, uh, the percentage of a debt that's expiring the next two years, and their cost of funding. I have it in my report, yeah, but I didn't put it in the slide. So if you like to see that, yeah, that is it's there in the, the report. Um and for the hedging strategies, so we understand that a lot of the REITs are still have having like maybe a uh, about 70 on average percentage hedge going forward that like they target that even though uh, we see interest rates probably declining in the near future future or at least stay staying higher for longer and then declining uh, maybe in 2024 and or 2025 but then for the hedging strategy a lot of the reads they do not enter into these hedges as a bet against interest rates so it's really just for hedging purposes so because of that, a lot of the REITs will still maintain their usual hedging stance of maybe 70%, even though 
they see in although although interest rates might uh, decline, a lot of REITs will just hedge around that amount because they, they do not enter into hedging strategies for interest rate a gamble, right? Like having a, a site is just purely for hedging purposes. Yeah, what is your view on class proposed acquisition? Yeah, so uh, the acquisition, in my view, I think it's a good acquisition. It's about a 1.8% accretive, but then, uh, and then they also have some AIs coming on that could uh, further uh, uh, bring the DPU higher once the AIs are complete. Yeah, so in my opinion, I think the, the acquisition is a good thing, but then their, their share price is just mainly hit by the EFR that they that they came out with. So the EFR, just to recap, is it was done at 1.025 cents. And then uh, just the day before it went X trading off the rights, the share price was already below 1.025 cents. So because of that, the take-up rate wasn't too good. And then it was fully under underwritten by the banks and the major book runners. So and then uh so it was about 100 million of shares issued in total for the rights issue. And then uh, the average daily trading volume for CLAS is only about 7 million. So if you see those, I mean, in a situation where all those who fully underwritten the shares, they might want to sell off the, the rights, they, they wouldn't have volume to do so as well because there's only 7 million as compared to the 100 million that was uh, issued just from the rights. And then this doesn't include the placement that was done before at 200 million, 200 million shares. Yeah, so because of this near term, we think CLS, there's a bit of headwinds. And then because of the share price, it already dropped quite a bit. We think a lot of it has already been factored in. So we think now is a, a good time. Yeah, I think that's all for me. Thanks. Um, there's a question on Sam Cox, so let me take that one. Okay. The question is, what target price do you have for Sandcorp? And which are its growth drivers? Do you expect any dividend growth? Sandcorp, uh, we have a target price of $6. Uh, how we derive at this target price is based on the EV EBITDA valuation. Why I use the EV EBITDA? Because then uh, it's more equitable to take into account all the all the resources that they had from shareholders as well as, uh, as, well as uh, banks to generate the, the EBITDA. EBITDA is before uh, interest, so I have also excluded the, the uh, income that they could, uh, they could accrue from the, from the deferred payment notes after the sale of their uh, Indian coal plants. So I, I think I've not uh, uh, included that in my valuation of Sankot. So the, I, I yeah, so uh, the, uh, the growth drivers uh, it's mainly is mainly driven by the renewable energy segment. They have uh, they have been growing their renewable energy portfolio, and by on November six, which they will hold an uh, investor day, they will elaborate further on how that portfolio had grown. So some some of these portfolios are green fuel or brown fuel. So most of them are coming, becoming operational um, uh, later, late, late 2023, which is now, uh, or 24 and 25. So we, we, we think the, the addition will be substantial. So with the risk renewable energy uh, assets, uh, the, we expect a jump in the, the, uh, the contribution. The, the latest um, price weakness is due to, uh, I think, two things. One is a, a group of uh, renewable energy players like BP has gone to the New York government to ask for an increase in the in the price a tariff for for uh, for energy, but that, that has been turned down. Uh, the argument that the New York government's New York uh, authority said was the the price that they are getting from the tariff that they're getting is already higher than the current. Uh, price from conventional energy, so which which means to say that uh, the 
yeah, the, the conventional energy is the prices are really up. So so until until the sorry, sorry, let me let me rephrase this again. So so the renewable energy players cannot be raising the price on the argument of higher inflation or high interest rate because they are still uh, a price higher and uh, enjoying a higher tariff than conventional energy. The other uh, weakness on the share price is that uh, the market is concerned that the higher interest rates might make it more expensive for new renewable energy assets to be to be um, uh, to be added on and uh, so but but I look at it from the other way around I find that if this is the case then it makes those who already have these assets uh, more valuable uh, um, and and it actually um, make the competitive landscape a bit more more uh, less less intense so so therefore I'm uh, keeping to my target price of six dollars for Semcorp. I don't expect any dividend growth because the until the new energy new new capacity come on stream which will probably be a uh, 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 significant uh, jump in earnings probably by FY25. Thank you I, ho I hope I've answered the question if not please please send it again thanks. Um, there's a question on any suggestion on stocks to purchase if I'm looking for stable dividend pay, payment of 4 to 6% per year, if not much fluctuation on stock price. The first stock that came to my mind is uh, Pay United. Um, the is, is delivering about 5.1% uh, dividend uh, yield based on my FY23 forecast. And FY23 is coming to an end soon. Um, and the uh, the, the company actually has a, a, a good growth story here in that the, uh, the higher uh, higher construction projects uh, awards coming through for uh, translating into higher progress payments for next year. Also the fact that uh, Pan United has been able to develop new new products that are more, more uh, uh, greener which is actually getting a lot more adoption by the, the market. The, 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 the buyers who have been buying their products are like your PSA, your Capital Land, uh, those developers. So as, as this new greener, greener concrete gets more, uh, gains more traction, and of course they, they are not, they are priced higher too. So we, we think that uh, there could be they could we could see a differentiation in the market place for for Pan United from other even our other uh, ordinary RMC providers. So 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 we, we still have a buy on Pan United. Thank you. I think I I pass on to the rest. Thanks very much. Meow, you can do the something. Uh, hi, I'll take the sound tab question. Uh, is sound tech rate a good buy now? What is the expected target level? So we have a buy recommendation for sound tech rate and the target price of $1.47. Uh, we like it mainly because of the cheap valuation. Yeah, as we mentioned, it's currently trading at record low of 0 0.54 times price to NAV. So which is lower than the average S rate of 0 0.86 times price to AUV. And the forward dividend yield is 6%. And yeah, again, there's a lot of concerns over the high gearing of 42.6%. And there are uh, third quarter results update is next week. So um, we'll update how the development is going on uh, after that. Yeah, thank you. There's a question on ST engineering. Maybe I can answer that one. Hi, any potential for ST engineering to increase dividend payout going forward? Dividend seems to be stagnant for many years already. Thanks. Uh, you're right. They just raised their dividend only in FY22 and uh, from 15 cents for uh to, to, to 16 cents. Um uh, they they guiding the dividend for this year to be 16 cents as well. We we don't see any increase in dividend. Possibility of increasing dividend. Um, I think the the they, they have some um, 
areas to to grow their revenue to, to, to grow their capex so so in in terms of adding the the MRO operations expanding the MRO operations and and also in the uh in the defense uh, space uh sorry so in the in the urban solutions so I we we think the 16 cents could be the the amount of dividend to be expect for annually which will really pay out quarterly so it's four cents per quarter thank you Okay, let me just try and answer everything then uh, as much as I can then talk 30 handing over to Zain. Uh, so uh, good morning. The Israel Hamas attacks cannot be contained. What is the uh, okay? So the it's obviously going to be uh it will be very bad for global markets because if it cannot if it keeps on spreading, uh because risk premium will rise. Uh, risk premium is just a, a fancy way to say that uh, you know, uh equity investors want a higher expected return over risk free rate or bonds uh, because they, they are getting I don't know because the, of the higher risk, perceived risk. So that's the first point. Then uh, secondly, if that contagion, if it's a Middle East conflict, then of course it will, it will filter into oil price. Uh, then you have rising interest rates and then you will get back this, the worst scenario, which is stagflation. So basically low growth and high inflation is like the worst of everything. So, so that would be the worst case uh, 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 scenario and it will affect every market. I, I think we, we, no one will be uh, immune, to, uh, immune to it. Uh, maybe they could, they could pivot back to US treasuries to, to kind of offset the risk. And then the third one were banks. Uh, of course, REIT will suffer the most. Uh, but banks, interestingly, if interest rates are higher, they will get the initial hit. But if interest rates continue to be high, then uh, they, they will... Uh, uh, they will benefit because the, their names will be sustained at these levels. Uh, okay. Uh, how, how do we find a recorded version of this and future webinars? So you just go to Philly Capital. I wanted to, to type in the answer. I accidentally clicked the wrong thing. But uh, it's actually... And I can't answer in the chat. So uh, you can find it in the recorded version in our YouTube. You just type Philly Capital and then uh, all, all our weekly webinars are, are in there, including our strategy and, and so forth. Uh, hi Paul, what's your view on Oceanus? So Oceanus had uh, a presentation with us. I didn't put a note there because uh was, wasn't really it. So my own view for Oceanus is that uh, the most interesting part for them is okay, so Oceanus used to be the abalone of a uh, harvester or farmer or uh but that land that is no longer a contribution. So they are more into distribution of FMCG products into China. Uh, but the new business business that could be more meaningful for them is that they are becoming a, a, strate a strategic, I guess, a food supplier to countries. So I think they made some deal with, I think Uzbekistan, or Kazakhstan, I can't remember which, which country, but uh, sorry for that, but they will become a supplier into China. So, so they, are they are becoming like a, a middleman for strategic food supplies. So that's the interesting part. Uh, it's just that uh, we, we don't know really the revenue contribution they didn't mention. So we just have to wait and see uh, how much can this contribute to earnings. But I guess that's the most exciting part for them. Uh, because for, for food security reasons, then uh, they, are, they act like a, a, saucer, a, a sourcing agent, I guess, for food supplies for, for countries such as China. So that, I guess that would be the most interesting part. Uh, your, your views on Wilma and Palm Oil, please. Uh, 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 I think we... For us, um, when the oil price increase, uh, of course, if there will be some positive impact to palm oil. Uh, but most investors are not really playing palm oil as a way to get uh, exposure to crude oil prices. So it's a bit too indirect from a stock market perspective. Uh, and, and then that's number one. Then number two, for Wilma, they are still going to be hit by a slowing China. So uh, that's why... Uh, uh, Wilma earnings will still be uh, sluggish at least until the for this the whole of this year because last year was exceptionally good so you you won't get any quarter year on year. Uh, the only interesting part for palm oil is maybe the like I said the El Nino effect. Uh, but but at this point in time it seems to be likely but again I, I don't dare to make a prediction on whether probably that's the probably the most disastrous thing to do. Now, uh, Pi, uh, which are the top five economic indicators that we should put most attention to? Uh, I think uh, in inflation will be the one. I think the core inflation or the core PCE. 
uh, that that would be the 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 key barometer and and also the other one will be the what data we use is the the monthly deficit spending by the US because as you know the whole US economy is being propped up by uh, the US government's uh, spending so if you see any noticeable sharp decline in that then you then probably the US economy is probably in a bit of a pickle that's probably two. I don't have time for. Uh, so I I will try to give five next time. These these two comes top of mind, and of course some of the the usual things are the bond markets. That's not indicated economic indicator, but I think that would uh, give a bit of the of the restaurants. I I'll type out all the five in our P three. Uh, uh, our P three uh community. I'll, I'll, we usually have a section where we we'll try where we we'll type out some of the answers that on some of the questions that were that were posed here. Uh, just one last uh last two uh any chance Paul and team has met Mermaid? yeah following their uh, thoughts on the noting that announced a very large contract yeah that's a very uh interesting thing we I, I didn't realize they had such a one such a huge contract that doubled their order book for Mermaid. uh I will send an email and then we'll try to get we should, I haven't seen them for so long they are a Thai company but we'll try our best they're part of the Thorson Thai I think yeah but we'll try our best to try to, to reach out to them. Uh, last one. Hi, Paul. What are the best investments during wartime? Okay, uh, depending what type of war, of course, the worst one, then just buy uh, tin, tin food, uh, aluminum tin can, tin can food into your house rather than invest. But I think the best investment usually for wartime should be commodities uh, because of the huge use of, of commodities during uh, actual war. I'm talking kinetic war, I mean real war. So that typically has been the best investments during war. Uh, but bonds don't really do well because interest inflation tend to spike up during wartime. Because if there's really wartime, then there'll be worries of supply of all the demand will spike up for commodities. So commodities tend to outperform. Yeah. Uh okay. I will I'll move on to Zane, then we'll try to pick up some more if there is not. But uh we will try to post some of this in our community. Uh can someone show the community? Page or, or Zin, you just go ahead and do your charts. Yeah, thanks. Hey, okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, let me just show the show the charts. Okay, so I'll start off with the first one it will be uh Far East Hospitality Trust. Okay, for Far East, currently it looks like uh, there's some uh, weakness in terms of momentum. Uh, the price hasn't been able to hold this 61 cents level, which has acted as a range support over here. So, then we've seen some retest and then price came back down again. Uh, also, looks like uh, struggling to hold this uptrend support line for now. So, I think possibly we could see maybe some a bit more downside to test possibly the, the 57.5 about 58 cents level over here as a next support for five years hospitality trust. Okay, the next one is uh, Agricultural Bank of China. So I think uh, this one recently, they, were, they did a retest of the highs at around uh, $3 over here. Um, There's some possible um bearish divergence in terms of momentum indicators. So uh, for now, could maybe see some sort of a range. Maybe we go and retest this uh, 292. Uh, this level that we broke out from over here. Uh, yeah. So I think we might see a little bit of a, a sideways movement for now. And last one is um uh 579 uh Beijing Tingna Clean Energy Company. Okay, so for this, um looks like um recently there has been a uh, continuation of the, the downside uh downtrend. Okay, so we went to retest about 155 previous, this key level again, previous um, resistance and support area. Found some support over here, but I think um, there should be still some um, some weakness ahead uh, since we actually broke down this range over here previously and there's some resistance around the 166, 167 level over here. Yeah, so possibly you might see some range or continue to uh, some downside if the lows cannot hold over here. Okay, um, then T for CLAS as well as uh, Parkway Life. 
Okay, so for CLAS, um, there's also some uh recently there have some downside momentum. We went to retest this eighty eight cents level. There's some support and did a bounce. So for now, perhaps I think also a bit of a sideways trading or maybe uh still downside bias. Uh, since there's no bullish divergence uh indicators uh showing up yet. Yeah, so perhaps we could still continue in this uh, downwards trend for now. Uh, resistance could be between like 93 cents or about 90, 95 cents. Uh, if we do a retest of this um, previous support breakdown as well as this downtrend resistance line. And as for Parkway live read, um, also, Still kept in the range, um, in a big range over here, and some resistance upon the breakdown over here at three seventy. So perhaps price will come down to retest the uh, support at around three fifty five to about three sixty over again, which was like, which was has been acting as a key support since, um, since uh, last year. Yeah. Okay, then I move on to the three local banks. So first one, DBS. Okay, DBS um still range for now. Um uh, uh resistance whenever it comes close to $34 at some support come at $33. Because the momentum is slowing down lower highs. So I think um perhaps price will come back down to retest the recent lows again over at close to $33 for some support. Again, yeah, could continue to just consolidate for now. For for OCBC. The OCBC still looks okay. The recently there was a break above this twelve ninety level, the retest. So if we're able to hold, perhaps uh price could still continue to move upwards towards like thirteen twenty. Um, the next resistance yeah thirteen twenty to about thirteen thirty, which will be the trend line resistance on this trend line over here. Yep, in terms of momentum wise, it's looking okay as well. And for UOB, a bit similar to DBS, um, still resistance whenever it comes close to about 2060, there's some support coming at or close to $28. Yeah, so I think perhaps you could do a retest and perhaps see where you find some support over here. Momentum is slowing down lower highs on MECD. Yeah, then uh next support will be the, the next level will be 2770 if you can't hold these lows. Okay, then next one, uh, Capital Land China Trust. Okay, Capital Land China Trust uh, recently it tested the 85 cents level, which was like a low back, like way back in 2020 over here. So then price uh, did some sort of a rebound. Um, tested the 87, 87.5 cents, 88 cents uh, previous support level, and as well as a recent breakdown. So. Perhaps I think we could see some sort of range uh, taking place for now. For for now, um, in terms of the indicators, why there's some lower, so higher low being formed. So, uh, there's some possible bullish divergence where maybe price could uh, pick up if it able to support the recent lows. Okay, then for Maple Tree Commercial Trust, uh, I think share price still remaining. Uh, there's still some weakness. Um, uh, we are still trading outside of this downtrend channel over here, and price is still um, uh, uh, showing some weakness. Uh, we've got lower lows, lower highs. Um, perhaps we could still see some sideways trading, but there's no bullish signals yet in terms of in the momentum indicator. So, perhaps we could. Yeah, there's some possible downside bias for for MPEG if it can't hold the lows at 134, uh, which was the recent lows. Okay, then there's a question: what is the technical sell for Tesla mean? Is there a long-term trend upwards in spite of the technical sell? Okay, let me just flash the chart for Tesla. So okay, so for Tesla, um technical sell means that it's based the call is based on purely on technicals, ignoring the fundamentals. And 
um, in my report, I mentioned that the time frame you look at is one to four weeks. So it's very, I'm um, looking at the very short term time frame. Short term wise, it's in a downtrend. You can see oh, range to downtrend. So in terms of lower highs, but the lows are still holding up over here. But in terms of lo up, the longer term wise, um, have your right, there's an uptrend going on. We have to look at like the longer term or the weekly chart. Yeah, so that, that's what I meant by a tanker sell. Okay, the next one, uh, Fraser Logistic Trust. Okay. okay. So for Fraser's Logistics Trust, I think price uh, just sideways for now, maybe you'll find that one support 106 previous, there was a previous swing low level back in November last year. I think um, price will continue to sideways for now. There's some possible resistance coming in maybe at, uh, between 111 to 113 uh, in terms of the near term support that was broken over here. Okay, then next one will be on prom next. Okay, prom next, um still continuing on the down the downtrend over here in spite of some uh, uh momentum just flattening off. Okay, um informing a range, but then it looks like it broke down broke down the 86 cents level recently. So if you do continue to see some some downside. Uh, possibly it could retest uh, previous swing low support at 83 cents. Uh, this was formed in March of this year. Yeah, the 83 cents level could be a uh, better support uh, since there was a previous resistance in April last year as well. So, two. Yeah, so let's see whether price is able to hold at this level. But for now, it's still in, a, in this um, downwards trend over here. Next one will be digital core read. The okay, digital core read um looks like a retest of this uh this um range breakdown over here, which is around fifty seven cents. So perhaps you could um there could be some resistance first upon the first retest. Yeah, but uh for now it looks like it's trying to. Okay, trying to move upwards for now. So some possible support could come in near 54 cents or 54 cents um, around this level over here. So Keppel DC rate. Okay, Keppel DC. Uh, I think some witness recently something to take note will be this um some breakdown stay in place. We have this this um uptrend support line breakdown towards end of September. Yeah, then also broke down the swing low is uh of about two oh seven over here. Yeah, then we look at the momentum indicators also flashing um bearish signals. So with that, I think um possibly we could see downtrend continue. Um, if it Perhaps we could go and test uh, the next support level between 194 to about one uh, 199 $2 over here. Yeah. Okay, then same core industries. Okay, same core industry. I think we're Possibly consolidating in the uh, in the uh, this wedge over here. So recently looks like um it's like price is going to retest the recent lows at four seventy two, but maybe we could go a bit lower, maybe like towards four sixties retest of higher this range uh, breakout level over here. Yeah, since that the momentum wise is still pretty um that's still that's still pre uh, pretty bearish for now for SEMCOP. Okay, then for venture, okay, venture has been still making lower highs and lower lows, so downtrend still um still intact. Um, then I think currently it's still fine. It's, it's it sometimes finds uh support from this uh, channel support over here. So perhaps if this holds and maybe uh, as well as the recent lows holds at around twelve 
twelve dollars, perhaps it's just sideways for a while. Yeah. If not, the next support level could be um closer to what eleven sixty. Which was like previous window and uh yeah. Okay, then uh and things sing. If you're thinking, I think still um perhaps some sideways trading for now. Um still finding a bit of resistance close to 80, close to the 86 cents mark. Yeah, then but I think maybe the recent hold those could be the hold for, for now. Um since there's a break, let's try to if there's a attempted break of this um this wedge over here. So if we see the lows at like, um, between 82.5 to 83 cents, it will hold, and maybe it could do some sideways action first for this week. Okay, then AEM. Okay, AEM, I think still still moving um, nicely. It have a higher high as well. And this was a retest of like 370 previous um, range breakdown level. So perhaps you could see a uh, some sort of uh, retest of this um, 360 level. If we find support, I think price could continue to move upwards. Since momentum indicators are still flashing uh, some bullish signals with higher highs uh, being formed. Okay, and next one, uh, Petro China. Yeah, I think it looks like uh still very much in the range for now. Um so I think probably that will continue. Recently there's a there was a breakdown and retest of this 575 level over here and uh some weakness in the momentum as well is coming down. Yeah, so perhaps still some maybe sideways trading around between like 550 550s to about 580 over here for for this week. If it's unable to break above this. Uh, level to test upwards of uh, six dollars. Then next up, Citrum. Okay, Citrum, I think still continuing to trend downwards. There's still no um, bullish signs in terms of momentum indicators. Um, yeah, it's this uh, last week, it's just a retest of like one. one um, 123, 124, and we came back to test the uh, downtrend with slide and price is just coming down again. So let's see, maybe if let's see whether the recent lows able to hold, then maybe just sideways for a while. If not, uh, could continue to hit for lower lows if it can't hold the recent lows, which might bring it closer to around 118 as a as a next possible support level. Okay, then uh, TSMC. Okay, TSMC, I think um, it's recently managed to get all this range at eighty nine dollars over here. And then we test of uh, near term resistance at ninety two ninety around close to ninety three dollars. So maybe you see a little bit of a pullback to try and retest this level over here. Then I think we could see some sort of a bounce. Um. Yeah, so we see some sort of bounce and support eighty eight to eighty nine dollars. Then, but trade price would do a bit of a range for now. Okay, then last one, uh, for is AMD. Okay, AMD, I think um, could do uh, they could pull back a bit um, because uh, last week we saw some some possible resistance at close to one hundred eleven dollars. Which was a previous swing high over here, as well as here back. This was in uh, late August and 
early September. So price start to pull back a bit on Friday. Near term support will be around uh, near term support with the recent break of this 104 over here. Yeah, so think maybe just sideways for a while or pull back. Yeah. This will do. Let's see whether this um channel is able to hold over here for AMD. Okay, yeah. So I think that's all for the technicals for now. I'll pass back the time to, to my colleagues to answer the, the other fundamental questions. John, John, you want to take the C question? Azin, can you pull up the, the community chat again? Yeah, sure. So there's a question on C. In your stock coverage, it shows the TP for C Limited is $87. Um, you know, what's the time frame to hit this price? So for all our target prices, or most of them at least, the time frame is one year. Um, so see the current price is around $45, $46. So the implied upside is about 80 to 90%. Uh, we think that, that um, you know, C has, has really been beaten down for quite a while, um, you know, over the last couple of years so we, so we think that you know there is probably a little bit more upside to it uh, and that's why our, our target price is 80 thanks 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 john uh so let me just answer this last one i think uh peggy probably answered the other one uh, uh so uh paul your view on uh prop next what can we expect moving forward from them in the next 12 to 18 months uh, i i think for for me the returns will, will there will be a rebound uh but then the, the share price might might move, uh, I don't know, maybe low sing a high single digit. Then most of the returns will still come from their dividend of about uh seven uh, seven percent dividend yield, unless we get a huge acceler, unless we get a huge uh, uh sorry unless we get a huge acceleration in volumes, uh, which is going to be unlikely. Uh, then I think this stock will still climb, but uh, a large part of it will come from their dividend yield. Uh, and dividend yield not only gives you the return. Uh, dividend yield also if can 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 defend the stock because if you have a high dividend yield, then you no know, uh, investors will, will will can defend this stock because it, um, uh, because they can maintain such a dividend yield for sustain it. Then this share price is not going to drop until then you become like a ten percent yield or, or nine or ten percent yield. So th that's why we are gra gravitating a lot to dividend yield stocks, uh, not only for the in uh, for the income. To offset any decline in the share price, of course not. But uh, the other reasons also can help defend the share price. Uh, but uh, we think it will be a it can't move aggressively unless you get a very strong recovery in volumes. Okay. Uh, with that, just a reminder, you know, in our our community just our re Singapore research. Uh, uh, our, some of the answers to the questions posed here will be posted in our Singapore equities research uh, community because there's a few communities here uh, then ours will be there if you are interested to look at it so uh, with that uh, I think I'd like to thank everyone for your time again you know, especially your questions and I hope to see you again next week and, and have uh, hope everyone have a very good week ahead thanks everybody and, and take care